Amen. I hope I didn't forget anything this morning, but thank you for coming together and praying for one another. That's, that's awesome. Love it. Love it. <clears throat> well, our, our theme this morning is Advent. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions here this morning. How many here uh, have a real tree at home, a real Christmas tree? How many of you have had a real tree in the past but have decided to get an artificial tree? All right. That's a lot of you. Why did you get an artificial tree? <laughs> exactly. Okay. The sap's annoying. Yeah. I like the smell of a real tree, but not everybody does. You're allergic. There are people that are, yes. We wondered if uh, there was allergies in our house, too. But, uh, yeah. I, who, when you had a real tree, who was in charge of watering the tree? <laughs> and did the tree get watered? Yeah, it did for the first couple days, maybe the first week, and then after that. Yeah, so if you've experienced a real tree, and it sounds like most of you have at one time or another, uh, you know that if you don't water a Christmas tree, an evergreen tree, uh, eventually it starts to dry out. In fact, it can even look green still, but it, it's drying out. Eventually they turn kind of orangey. Um, you know, you've waited too long to take it outside then. Um, but uh, they can look green, but if they're dried out, sometimes you can go and tap a branch and, right, all the pine needles fall down. And uh, <clears throat> it's, it's, a, it's a real mess. Well, <clears throat> I, want, I would like to invite you to turn to Jeremiah 17. I'm doing a Christmas message from Jeremiah, if you can believe it. Jeremiah is a prophet. He was known as the weeping prophet. It was kind of a bad time for Judah's, Judah's history. Bad things happening, bad things coming. Jeremiah was the one that got to, to share all the bad news. What a job, eh? By the way, our nation's going to be destroyed by an invading nation. Merry Christmas. Right? Yeah. The other prophets are all saying, you know what? We're blessed. We, we, are, we have prosperity and there's so many good things happening. And, and everybody else is saying, God must, be, God must be happy with us. God must be happy with us. But Jeremiah says, no. No, not so much. So I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you know where... Uh, the Christmas tree came from the whole idea, but uh, you, you can look back in history and and you can find pagan rituals, but you can also find where they just brought uh, evergreens in, into the house because they are colorful. You know, in winter, when everything is dry and, and no color, you know, you bring in a tree and you decorate and it's nice. And, and uh, I guess uh, they're blaming it on the Germans for uh, bringing it to America. Um, but... Uh, and it was still considered pagan for a long time, but then I guess uh, Queen Victoria and Prince uh, Prince Albert. Albert. Yes, there was there was an article done up on them, and uh, they uh, there was a Christmas tree decorated in the back. So then it became a, a really good thing and popularized, and uh, we decorate it, and it becomes comes for the Christians. It's become a symbol of of new life, right? It's um, which is funny because we cut the tree down and bring it in and it's going to die. But, but it represents something green and living and, and the, the new life of Christmas and uh, just, just the festivities around celebrating Jesus. That's what it is for us. <coughs> but uh, <coughs> in Jeremiah's day for the nation of Judah, it was doom and gloom on the horizon. The Babylonian army and the kingdom was coming and God knew it. The prophets, other prophets denied it. But uh, as he spoke, uh, who is going to heed the warning and make their hearts right with God? Who is going to turn to God? Well, the people didn't repent. Yeah, so hang on here. We're going to be talking about joy. Uh, Jeremiah 17. 
Let's, uh, let's read that this morning. I think it's on the screen there in front of you. Yes, it is. So I'm going to pull that up here. I'm just going to read it through, and then we'll walk through it. It says, The sin of Judah is inscribed with an iron chisel, engraved with a diamond point on their stony hearts and on the corners of their altars. You know, in fact, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk about that for a moment. If, uh, if there's any uh, construction people here today, or if you've done any engraving, you know the importance of, uh, of having the right bit when, it, when you want to engrave in stone or something, stone's really hard, right? So you need something even harder to, to grind. So I don't, know, I don't know if you've ever done any grinding in a stone, but, you know, here's a diamond-tipped thing that I've used before to engrave something. I couldn't find any examples, but... Yeah, and the idea of an iron chisel, or some translations may say a pen of iron. It's saying, it's saying their, their hearts are, have become so hard to God. They're like stone. It's so hard. Um, but their sin is, is chiseled in. Their sin is engraved in with a diamond point tool in the sense that this is not a picture of somebody writing your sins in the icing of a cake. We're going to have cake later, by the way. Kids Church is inviting us for Jesus' birthday party, so stick around for cake afterwards. <clears throat> Pastor, keep it short so we can have more cake. And uh, so this is not writing the sins into the icing of a cake where it's like, oh, don't touch that, and we'll smooth it over, and it's, it'll disappear, right? This isn't sidewalk chalk where we're writing the sins on the sidewalk, and, uh, you know, after a rain or two, it disappears. No, this is, uh, uh, this is their sin was a continuous persistence, rebellion against God, their idolatry and adultery um, were running rampant, and it, was, it wasn't just a one bad decision. It it was a continuous thing. Their hearts were hard from God, and these sins were chiseled. It talks about how they're engraved in. They're not just going to go away. They're not just going to be forgotten. It's not going to fade away. Um, it, was, it was very, very, very uh, obvious and permanent. And Jesus and God, God this was before Jesus, but God, God saw it all. God saw it all. It goes on in verse 2, even their children go to worship at the pagan altars and the Asherah poles beneath every green tree and on every hill. You know, they're worshiping at pagan altars, these Asherah poles or green trees and high hills. Their hearts were turning to other things. They're, they were not turning to God. God was not the center of their attention. They, they were focused on other things. Uh, like I said, the all the people were prospering, and the other prophets were saying, you know, God's been blessing us, so we must be doing the right thing, even though we're being very broad in our worship and opening up to all kinds of things. And, and, uh, but the truth is, they had turned away from God. <clears throat> and now this had even become a generational thing as well. Their children were worshiping other gods and uh, doing the wrong things. So, okay, does this relate to us? After all, um, does anybody have an Asherah pole in their backyard? No. Um, you know, that was a false god. It was uh, a goddess, and uh, apparently she, she's the one that birthed another fa false god, Baal. You remember it's Baal in the scripture? Um, so, uh, lots going on there, but a false god, it really, it really represents idol worship, uh, idolatry. And idolatry is something that we can all relate to. Any time that we're putting ourselves before God, any time that we're putting worship or trust in something other than God, if we're putting our trust in our money, in our bank account, in our good job, you know, thinking we have security in that, if we're putting trust in other people, if we're putting trust in, in other false gods, uh, whatever it is that we might be turning to, that is considered idolatry. And that's what they were doing. They were turning to other gods. And, and, uh, and that sin was etched permanently on their hearts. But this is where we remember as Christians, and we have now Jesus to, to look to. God promised Messiah, and now we look back and say the Messiah has come, the Savior, our Lord. And we remember our greatest joy that God provided for us. Somebody that would die for our sins. Because these things, these sins were etched on our hearts. 
we couldn't wash them away ourselves. They, they weren't going to fade. God wasn't just going to say, I don't see that anymore. But because of what Jesus did, he paid for those sins and washed them all away. He paid for them, right? So they've been dealt with. Done. He didn't just forget about them. He actually justified them through his perfect justice. Yeah, so, and the, and the promise, and the promise that God makes, the promise that God makes in Ezekiel 36, 26, this is, I, I love this verse. It says, I give you a new heart, and I put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And that's the, that's, I love that, doesn't that? God gives us a new, new heart. He takes that heart of stone out because we can't fix it. We can't erase it, but he gives us something new. A living heart that beats for Jesus and a new spirit, the Holy Spirit of God that dwells in us, it uh, does that transforming work in our lives. You know, I had a, had a discussion with someone recently that, uh, uh, that perhaps we expect as Christians that uh, we're not going to have any struggles. You know, I'm a Christian, so why am I struggling with this? You ever, you ever think that way? You ever feel guilty about struggling with something? I, I'm a Christian. I, I shouldn't be struggling with this anxiety. I shouldn't be struggling with this depression. I shouldn't be struggling with this doubt. I shouldn't be struggling with, with finances and thinking, you know, how am I going to pay the next bill? Why well, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be struggling with that because I'm a Christian, right? <clears throat> and so that can be a, there can be a lot of guilt on Christians at the same time. And, and yes, we are sanctified immediately in that Jesus' righteousness is given to us. When we put our faith in him, uh, his righteousness washes us. Our God looks at us as being righteous because he sees Jesus. We receive Jesus. So there's a, an immediate sanctifi sanctification that happens, a big word. Um, but there's also the process of sanctification where he is working out that new, new thing in us. We don't automatically become perfect when we become Christians. Well, I didn't anyways. I didn't. And yet we can be so hard on ourselves, and, and yet God is wanting to do that process in us, that transforming work, and we have to go through trials, and we have to go through struggles because it's through that that we learn to, to trust Him. That's, that's purification happens. That sanctification is at work. Those struggles are part of learning to trust and depend and and love God completely. <clears throat> well, what's going to happen to Judah here? Verses 3 and 4. So I will hand over my holy mountain along with all your wealth and treasures and your pagan shrines as plunder to your enemies. For sin runs rampant in your land. The wonderful possessions I have reserved for you will slip, uh, for you will slip from your hands. I will tell your enemies to take you as captives to a foreign land for my anger blazes like a fire that will burn forever. This, this, might wreck, this might wreck your view of God if you think God is all loving and God is all, <coughs> all forgiving. <coughs> there is a side to God which is about justice as well. And because of his sin, he's, they are being handed over to their decisions to walk in sin. And we know that the, the wages of sin is death, as it says in Romans 6.23. We know that there is eternal death that, become, that comes as a result of our sin. You know, it, their sin, as seen by God, caused, caused him to say, for my anger burns, uh, my anger blazes like fire that will burn against them forever. Um, God does take, God takes sin very, very seriously. Take sin very, very seriously. In fact, the picture here, if we look back in Jeremiah 16, 2, we realize that God actually told Jeremiah, he said, with everything that is about to happen, with this destruction and all, with Babylon coming, it's going to be terrible. It's going to be miserable. He, he actually told Jeremiah, don't marry. Don't have any children. This isn't the time to marry or have children. Spare yourself the sorrow, for it's going to be so bad when Judah falls. It says in, in chapter 16, 16 to 18, it says, I'm going to send fishermen to catch them. That, that's the people of Judah. I'm going to send fishermen to catch them. I'm going to send hunters to hunt them down. I see every sin. I will do double their punishment for all their sins because they have defiled my... Are we talking about joy still? Did we, did we lose that somewhere? Um, 
you know, but God is saying that, uh, you know, this is the judgment for sin. And he says, God's anger blazes like a fire that will burn forever. Yikes. Like I said, that imagery may wreck your image of God if you simply think God is all love and forgiving and forget, and that he just forgets. Um, but he despises idolatry, evil, rebellion. God's anger burns forever. Well, we know eternity, there is heaven and hell. And when you die, there will come a judgment and you will be heaven bound or hell bound. However, hear this, hear this, hear this. This is the important part. God made sure to provide a way of redemption. That is our, that is our God that loves us. And yet, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Jesus, our Savior, we put our faith in him. He did the work of, of salvation for us on the cross, and we need not fear. Hear that? We need not fear judgment. Hallelujah. All that talk of tragedy and death and hell. We need not fear judgment at all. God's wrath is removed because our sins are paid for in Jesus Christ. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Right? Do we all need to sing that now? We need to change gears here. Oh, it's a good time to remind everyone that, that, I think it's a good time to remind everyone that happiness is, is one thing. When we talk about happiness, we're, we're really talking about a feeling, right? I feel happy. But when we're talking about joy, right? Joy, however, is rooted deeper. It's based on the facts. It's based on truth. And feelings come and go, and we can't trust feelings. In fact, if somebody says, hey, just, just go by your feelings. Your feelings will guide you, right? You know, run away. Run away, because that's bad teaching. It's really bad teaching. Now, the truth is, we can feel lousy, and we can feel on top of the world. In both situations, we can still have a joy that supersedes all those feelings because of the fact that Jesus is our hope, our hope, our love, our joy, and next week our peace we're going to emphasize, right? It supersedes all that. So you can feel crummy today. You can feel overwhelmed. You can feel miserable today. But to know that the joy of the Lord is my strength, the truth of who Jesus is is my strength. I think every, every Advent for joy, I mentioned Nehemiah 8.10. It says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Right? So even if you're feeling crummy, know deep down, know deep down that Jesus has you. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that just, I hope that lifts you up this morning. He carries me through the dry and desert land. He picks me up from the pit. We might not feel victorious, but Jesus is still our victor. The Lord says in verse 5 and 6, this, going to that scripture again, verse 5 and 6, it says, The Lord says this, Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert. They're like a Christmas tree cut off and brought into your house and not watered. Um, with no hope for the future, they will live in a barren wilderness in an uninhabited, salty land. It says, if, it says in verse 5, if you are not trusting in the Lord, who are you trusting in? Are you trusting in mere humans? Are you trusting your bank account? Are you trusting... Uh, the, the big mistake, detrimental to our lives. We curse ourselves if we put our trust in anyone or anything other than God. If we put our trust in, in others, mere humans, trusting in a leader, trusting in a king, trusting in a government to look after us, trusting in the American army to protect Canada, if somebody should come and invade Canada, we always thought, you know, the, the, Rus the, the states will look after us, right? Um, <clears throat> right? Anytime you put your trust in humans, get ready to be disappointed. You know what the, the people of Judah were going to do? Their plan was to, to make an alliance with the people of Egypt. That was their plan. That was their backup plan. You know, we're going to be strong because Egypt is going to come and be our alliance. Well, Egypt was overrun too. That didn't work. Babylonians still came. 
So warning, you can put all your ducks in, the or, in an order, in order, you can form your alliances, you can fortify yourself with all your strengths that you can muster, you can pad your bank accounts, you can put, but if you don't put your trust in God, you curse yourself, it says. What's your plan? What's your backup plan? Do we have a backup plan? Well, got money saved somewhere. Um, family? your skills, your talents. I talked to a person this week who um, in his lifetime, this goes back in his story, but uh, um, he was really down and out, <laughs> really down and out. There's a lot going on. Um, but uh, when he was crashing, he called his parents to rescue him, to, to take him in. You know that his parents said no? His parents said no. And it was devastating. No, this isn't really a good time for you to come. Um, that was supposed to be a safe place. That was supposed to be a safe place. You know, and man, I'm so thankful that for the family and friends that I have. But ultimately, ultimately, my foundation and my safe place is my Lord. He is my rock and my fortress. What's your backup plan? What's, let, it, let, it, let Jesus be your, the one that you put your trust in. A person will be like an animal in the desert dying of thirst. If he doesn't trust the Lord, he'll be like a stunted shrub that's just going to grow a little and ultimately perish, just like those dried out Christmas trees. This is the imagery the Lord uses to describe what our lives are without him. Not just without him, but without him front and center. And in contrast, verses 7 and 8, it says, But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They're like trees planted by a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. It's the same imagery you see in Psalm verse 1. It says, Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their, la their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. You are blessed when you put the, make the Lord your hope and confidence. That's where blessing is found. Uh, to, to be able to turn to the Lord each day, to know his promises, to know his faithfulness. You know, what does blessed look like? It says here, blessed looks like a tree that's planted by a river and, and drawing the roots drawing from that source of water that's just always there. It's not affected by the drought. It's not bothered by the heat. And drought and heat were coming for the people of Judah, uh, but they didn't put their trust in the Lord. But for us as, as Christians... Uh, that, is, that is what we have in Christ. Well, we, we can plant our roots in Him, and, and if our roots are drawing from Him, the river of life, we don't have to be worried about drought. We don't have to be bothered by the heat because our roots are deep, uh, deep and the river is our Lord. Now, there's a lot of drought around us. If you, don't know, if you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of drought. There's a lot of heat that are happening in this world today. A lot of negative things happening in this world. A lot of scary things. Wars and rumors of wars. Uh, there's famine going on. There's, there's political unrest. There's economic unrest. There's broken relationships. There's health issues like we've never seen before. And so there's all kinds of drought and and heat that are coming on, but as, as Christians to know that we can, we can root into Jesus and find that hope and find that joy and find that strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. I, uh, again, I, I talked to another person recently this week, and uh, he, just wanted, he just wanted it all to end. Not, not, not in the sense that he was suicidal, but uh, he wanted it all to end. He wanted Jesus to come. Jesus, just come now. Just come now. As I, I'm tired of this world, and I, I'm tired of seeing... See, I, I'm I don't like what I'm seeing, and I just want it done. And, and I get what he was saying. You know, in some ways, Jesus, come. Just come right away. Yeah. And uh, I get what he's saying. But at the same time, the way I was hearing it, and maybe it was just me, I didn't, I didn't press him on it, but uh, um, I, sus I suspected a hint of depression there. An expression, you know, words of tiredness. Oh, Jesus, just come. I'm so tired of this. And to me, it didn't sound positive. It was, it's not like the words of a tree that's deeply rooted in the river of life. No, that's okay. Like I said, we have bad days too. I, I'm, I'm not saying that we all have to walk around, oh, I'm so happy today and put on something phony, right? But uh, like I said, joy goes deeper than that. And and uh, I, I know I tried to to bring encouragement 
uh, to him, just emphasizing the fact that we don't need to fear, we don't need to worry. God has a plan for us. We can experience the, the, the wonders of God and the, the love of Jesus right now. We have a mission to do. We've got things that we can get excited about, and uh, God is moving. I've seen God moving. God was moving here this morning. Testimonies are being shared. God is moving. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And so uh, Jesus is our river. But let's, let's also remember that uh, we, can, uh, we can bring some of that river to one another and bring encouragement and remind each other, yes, God is moving, yes. Now get your roots deep into Jesus because uh, this is exciting. Um, <clears throat> trouble may come, but I have my Jesus. Oh, praise God that I have my Jesus. Who do you trust in if you don't have Jesus? Blessed are those who trust in the Lord. Verse 8 says, green leaves in all seasons. God is producing good in my life in all seasons. Well, I'm going to wrap it up there. I'm not going to go into verse 9 and 10. Uh, but it talks about um, just how God examines our hearts. We can't necessarily trust our own hearts because they're broken and, and that doesn't always lead us in the right path. So that's why we lean into our God more and more. Go, God, search me. Know if there's any way in me. If there's any way in me, point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Give me a new heart, O oh God, a heart that looks to you, a heart that receives direction and correction and grows in faith. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Can I show you a video quick? I was going to do this earlier, but this is a cute video. Some of you have seen it before. I think Ricky and I acted this out at a Christmas Eve service once, but uh, it just talks about how we can't replace uh, Jesus with anything. Jesus is it. So watch this, and then I'll dismiss you. Hey, Ed. Come check out my North Star Christmas tree topper at Levitate's. Is this a gummy bear? Yeah, we lost baby Jesus. Hey, check out these LED lights. I have them synced up to a 76 hour all Christmas music playlist. There's my little Christmas DJ. <laughs> <laughs> so are you waiting till Christmas is over so you can go buy a new nativity set when they're on sale? Huh? No, no, oh no. We lost baby Jesus like 11 years ago. Is, is baby Jesus always a gummy bear? Oh, uh -huh. no, oh, we trade it every year. Yeah, like uh, last year it was a uh, tiny troll doll. And the year before that we used a uh, dog treat. They were the perfect size, but <laughs> Dalton kept taking them and eating them. You, you mean your dog kept stealing them? No, my son Dalton, he loves those dog treats. Especially the peanut butter ones. There was one year that we used a, uh, a doll head. That was creepy. We, we made a modeling clay, baby Jesus. So the dog took that one too. Um, one year we got desperate and used an ice cube. That was a miss and a mess. Yeah, just seems like everything we try to replace baby Jesus with never lasts. Say that again. Everything we try to replace baby Jesus with never seems to last. And? And what? Say it again, slowly. Why? Just do it dulcimo, slowly, do it. I don't understand what's happening. Just do it. This is getting weird. Fat! Fine! But when I'm done saying this, you're gonna march in here and you're gonna watch my star levitate. Fine, 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 do it. Fine. Everything we try to replace baby Jesus with never seems to, oh, yep, there it is. Okay, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Amen. Nothing can replace Jesus. Nothing can replace Jesus. Heavenly Father, may nothing in our lives replace you. May you be front and center in our hearts and lives. We are blessed if we do. We are blessed if we do, and we thank you. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you. Yeah. Oh, I did mention it. Yeah. Don't don't leave. Are the kids ready? The kids have a 
birthday cake for Jesus next door, and we're going to celebrate us with a piece of cake. So head over to the hall and grab a piece of cake and enjoy one another's company. Encourage someone this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.